Dia salah satu perempuan paling berpengaruh di dunia. Well, you know, becoming the CEO of YouTube was a big decision for me. Mother of YouTube, ibu dari platform yang mengubah begitu banyak. Mata Najwa terbang ke markas YouTube di Silicon Valley, California untuk berbincang dengannya. Kami menggali cerita tentang platformnya yang digunakan ratusan juta orang setiap hari. Juga bertemu dengan orang-orang Indonesia yang berada di belakangnya. There's so much that we want to discuss with you. Um, you've been a CEO for YouTube for eight years now, right? Mm -hmm. And then yes. you've been with Google for 24 years. Yes. Wow. Has it been more challenging over the years or has it been more manageable because you've been a pioneer in this field for so long? Oh, it, it's just changed so much. Uh -huh. I, there's no comparison between what it was like when I first started and now. So when I first started working at Google, I was actually employee 16 of Google. Mm -hmm. And Google had no revenue. Nobody had heard of Google. Mm -hmm. And so the challenges were very different. Mm -hmm. First was about like how, how do you create a brand? How mm -hmm. do you build a brand? How do you make, is this a product that people want? Mm -hmm. And now, if you fast forward today, the challenges that we have are very different. It's about running a much bigger service, mm -hmm. having a global brand, and um, there's also a lot more um, scrutiny um, and responsibility that comes with running mm -hmm. a really big company. Semua berawal dari garasinya. Menlo Park, Silicon Valley, 1999. Susan menyewakan garasinya kepada dua mahasiswa Stanford University. Larry Page dan Sergey Brin, yang kala itu tengah merintis bisnis teknologi mereka, Google. Because I actually joined Google with no revenue. It had just gotten started. It wasn't a proven company at all. In and your garage? It was in I my it was in my garage. <laughs> but the the thing I'm pointing out is I was it, the reason I wanted it in the garage. It was not because they were famous or doing anything great. It's because I wanted the rent. <laughs> Just to be clear, <laughs> I needed it to pay the mortgage of the house. So that was also a big important. That was the whole reason I had them there. <laughs> yeah, they weren't famous. Uh -huh. um, and but you sort of knew that they would become big. Maybe. Like, like a hunch or? No, at first I had no idea. Okay. I had no idea when they first started. I just rented it for them for the rent. Mm -hmm. um, but then oh, as I started talking to them and I started using the service, I, I began to realize that they were onto something good. Mm -hmm. um, and that's when I joined the company. But um, joining them was a big step. Um, I was actually pregnant, I had a mortgage, so joining a company with no revenue was not an obvious decision. Susan pun bergabung menjadi karyawan nomor 16, menjabat manajer pemasaran yang pertama di Google. Prestasinya, Google AdWords, AdSense, Analytics, adalah contoh produk-produk ciptaan Susan. Tapi keputusannya yang paling meninggalkan impak bagi kita adalah menyarankan Google untuk membeli YouTube di saat banyak orang justru meragukan platform video ini. Well, you know, becoming the CEO of YouTube was a big decision for me. Uh, actually, like Larry, the founder of Google, was the one who asked me. He asked me, like, what do you think about YouTube? And I knew that if I didn't, in that moment, say that I wanted the job, I may never have another chance at it. So. Just, I had to... That's just another way of proving that, you know, women should have, you know, should take the initiative, should say yes when the job offer comes. I mean, that's just another example of how you make it in this well, world. Well, I right? knew. I knew that if I didn't say yes right then and there, that I, would never, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have another chance. Did you have any doubts at all? Did you have, did you... No. No? I, I thought you it was... knew it right away? Yeah. I, well, he asked me and I thought about it and I was like, yeah, this would be great. I mean, the only reason I might have had reservation is because I was running Google's advertising. I was building Google's advertising system. So mm. I had more reports. There was more revenue. YouTube was pretty small. Mm. And so a lot of people back were asking. Yeah, back then it was really small. And so people were asking like, well, why are you going to this smaller job? Uh. You have less responsibility in uh. some ways. But I knew that YouTube, I knew that video was going to be big. Mm. Nilai YouTube kini 17 kali lipat harga akuisisinya. Dengan lebih dari 2 miliar pengguna aktif, YouTube berkembang menjadi platform raksasa dunia. 
Namun di sisi lain, sejumlah negara punya aturan khusus terhadap YouTube, termasuk memblokirnya. I want to talk about more about the um, how we've seen now there's this increase um, calls for regulations of big internet platform companies mm -hmm. in the areas of safety, privacy, business model competitions, and sure. you've been in the tech industry for 30 years. So what do you think should be the approach in regulating the industry? Sure. Well, definitely we are seeing a lot more regulation um, everywhere in the world. We're um, across the board. And I think it's, you know, it's, uh, it's not just us. It's all types of technology and all types of media content. Yeah. And, you know, I first want to just you know, point out that I, I do think that that um, services like Google and YouTube have enabled a lot of new voices, a lot of new information, um, and we've seen a lot of jobs, um, economic creation and value that has come out of that along with people's ability to educate themselves and um, get entertainment for free and services mm -hmm. that are very valuable. Mm -hmm. um, so I think in general, our goal is to, to figure out, and, and the goal of governments is to figure out how do we preserve what is good about the internet um, But then it's also brought up hard challenges. Um, YouTube sees it, particularly with issues around, um, you know, some of the core issues have been around content moderation. We always work with governments to the extent that they're trying to figure out what the right policies are and, and explaining what could be unintended consequences of that policies. Mm -hmm. um, but we do want to be think it's, it's important to give, to enable companies like ours to continue to have the ability to make decisions. Um, and we are responsible. Do you think sometimes government are stepping in too far? Well, I, I mean, gover we work with governments. And I, I think one of the challenges, sometimes the governments don't, there, are, there can be unintended consequences where they may intend something. Um, they have good intentions. We're aligned with what those intentions are. But it could have consequences that would go far beyond what they ever intended. Mm. And if you see that happening, how does, what, You know, what sort of steps that YouTube usually takes? Would you just talk directly to each government and trying to lobby them? Or what are, what will <laughs> usually happen behind those closed doors? Because right now in Indonesia, they are also, they are all, they're preparing a new regulations sure. that would make the platforms, internet platforms, they would, they would get fined, mm -hmm. even criminally charged mm -hmm. if they fail to take down an unlawful content for mm -hmm. four hours. Mm -hmm. And they said that this new regulation could be the toughest globally on social media. Mm -hmm. So what's your take on that? I mean, it's still going on right now. The debate is still going sure. on. Sure. So we can see that happening. Sure. Well, so, I mean, I, usually what, ha what happens when there, is regu there are regulations like that, we will meet with the government mm. and we will look at it because, of course, we also don't want to have unlawful information on our platform. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also a question of, you know, how is that defined? Of course. Um, it could be very arbitrarily. Unlawful could mean like a lot of things to a lot of people. It could mean a lot of things to a lot of people. It also means, what does it mean four hours? Is it four hours from when it was posted? Is it four mm -hmm. hours from when we were notified? Mm -hmm. um, exactly. So how is that actually defined? Mm -hmm. um, and then, um, so we'll work with governments to make sure that it's something that can be You know, a, like, accomplished, and mm. B, that it accomplishes what they really want. Mm. Um, and um, sometimes our creators will also talk about it to the government because mm. the, you know, cre the creators will be concerned because if there's regulation that's passed that impacts them, that could hurt their business, their ability to generate revenue or mm. have views, you know, it's important for the governments to know about that as well. Mm -hmm. And sometimes... Um You know, we've seen in certain part of the world, government using these new regulations mm -hmm. to actually curtail the free, you know, the, the freedom of the speech and then to curtail the free expression. So they're using this tool to suppress critical voices. Um, well, how does YouTube see that? I mean, using internet regulations to actually, you know, quiet down the critical voices in the country. I mean, we have seen that in some parts of the world, not, not all parts of the world. And... It's a worrying trend, though. It, it's it is it is a worrying trend, um, but we but we see it in some parts more than other parts. Mm -hmm. um, so, and some governments more than other governments. And you know, in general, we want to enable political speech. So, um, 
like when we do get requests that would involve suppression of political speech, that's a place where um, we're we're um, very um, hesitant or resistant to removing it. There can be many different cases. So there could be, and that's why I say every case depends mm. upon what's happening. It could be if there's some risk of civil unrest or danger to citizens, that's something that we would certainly look at. Um, but in general, we want to be enabling, um, we want to en enable people to express their points of view mm. um, and as enable as much free speech as we possibly can have. Mm -hmm. That also happens with human rights. Of course. We'll also course. see that with human rights, and if we're worried that there's violations of human rights, that's another place. So we may get requests that we can't always honor from various governments as but a result of that. As a, you know, being a private company, can you do that? Can you like say no to governments? I mean, how do you draw the line? You know, where does the responsibility of the government and then the private companies and other stakeholders? <laughs> it's, it's a really tricky balancing thing. It, it is. It is. And I will say that you know, governments pass laws and we, um, we try to adhere to the laws as much as possible. Sometimes there's some gray areas about how it's interpreted. Mm -hmm. um, but if you, for example, have a non-democratically elected government mm -hmm. and they're asking us to remove content that would be suppressing free speech of people who are being persecuted in some way, mm -hmm. that's a place where it would be, for example, of where it would be harder for us to to remove that content. Mm -hmm. we, would we would keep it up. Mm -hmm. Tantangannya menyeimbangkan antara kebebasan berekspresi dengan kebutuhan melindungi audiens dari konten-konten negatif. Sepanjang tahun 2021, YouTube menghapus tak kurang dari 25 juta video karena melanggar community guideline mereka. Dengan jutaan video baru muncul di tiap harinya, tentu ini bukan tugas mudah. Do you yourself believe in censorship? Because, you know, <laughs> some would argue that censorship can actually be counterproductive. If you want to fight misinformation, it's by doing that to have a free flow of information, not by censoring it. What do you think? There are uh, lines that we draw that we think are not, don't make sense for us to have on our platform, like adult content. Like that was like probably the first policy that was made. Mm -hmm. If we had enabled adult content, it would have really changed what the nature of YouTube is. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, we look at, um, like many different important areas, and we believe that it's important for us as a service. We are paying for the hosting of the platform, um, the distribution of that content. You know, we have an, we're an advertising supported content provider. Uh, if we have a lot of content that is seen as undesirable or not supporting society or not being responsible, um, we'll also see pullback from our advertising community. Mm. So, you know, we want to do the right thing, but we also, as a business, I believe, operate very differently than, say, the internet as a whole, mm. where people can go and post their information. Mm. Perempuan dan teknologi, dua hal yang kerap dianggap berseberangan. Tapi sosok Susan menjadi bukti yang bisa meruntuhkan konsepsi itu. Selain cukup vokal, ia giat mengadvokasi kebijakan-kebijakan yang lebih ramah terhadap perempuan bagi lingkungan kerja. Termasuk meningkatkan jumlah karyawan perempuan di YouTube. And I remember reading your article in Vanity Fair. Uh -huh. I think it was called... <laughs> The Silicon Valley Boys Club. They're breaking up the, the Silicon breaking, up, breaking yes, up the breaking Silicon up the Valley, Silicon, yeah, Silicon Valley I, Boys I Club. Because it was so vividly described, uh -huh. you know, the implicit biases that women are facing in the workplace, mm -hmm. and it's happening in every industry, especially in the mm -hmm. male-dominated industry. Mm -hmm. My question is: Do you still face that challenges, or now that you know, being the Susan Wojcicki, now the challenges are different for you? Really what I'm focused on right now are trying to support younger women mm -hmm. and women in the workforce. That's really my main focus and, and trying to be a role model and trying to talk about being a woman and, and challenges that I may have faced and how, mm -hmm. I, how I address them. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm really focused on. I think technology is a great field. It's a growing field. It's mm -hmm. where the jobs are. It's mm -hmm. what's changing our world. And it's upset me that that women are not equally represented. They are mm -hmm. underrepresented in technology. And so you think this is the trends of the future. These are the jobs of the future. And women are not getting the skills to participate in that. And as a result, I believe it's going to set women back because they're not going to be part of this new economy and this new, new media. Ravi. Ya, Pak. Saya mau bertanya pada Ravi. Apa, Pak? Cita-citanya. 
Pengen jadi apa? Jadi youtubers, Pak. Keputusan-keputusan Suzan dalam pengelolaan YouTube tentu terasa pengaruhnya sampai ke Indonesia. Sebanyak 139 juta atau lebih dari setengah populasi Indonesia adalah pengguna aktif YouTube. Tidak heran jika YouTuber jadi profesi yang banyak diimpikan anak-anak muda. Sebuah riset bahkan menyebut 31 persen remaja ingin menjadi social media influencer atau YouTuber. Kids nowadays, when yes. they're asked, mm-hmm. what do they want to be when they grow up? Yes. They don't say doctors or you know engineers anymore. They say they want to be a YouTuber. Mm-hmm. So what's your take on that? The notions that now kids are seeing mm-hmm. YouTube content creator as a dream job. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and it, it's for some for some creators it. will become um, a, a profession. Mm. Um, but I would say for kids, even when it's not going to become a profession or for, for young adults or college-age students, it is a way for people to express themselves and to share a passion. Mm. And it, you think about it, um, different programs that you would do in school, right, right, where you're writing an essay. In order to create content, as you know, to create a video, you have to write a script. You have to have a point of view. You have to express it, and you have to think about the brand and what you're expressing. Um, so I do think that there are a lot of advantages for users to think about it, even though most of, you know, some of them will go on and become stars, and some may just do it as a hobby in the future. Tak hanya YouTuber. Bekerja di raksasa teknologi seperti YouTube maupun Google juga jadi impian anak Indonesia. Saya mampir ke Google Plex, bertemu dengan dua anak muda yang bekerja di sini. Rachel Saputro sudah empat tahun bekerja di Google. Kini ia seorang program manager di DeepMind, laboratorium AI Google. Juga Alif Rohman, empat tahun juga bekerja di Google. Alif adalah engineer di sistem web crawling Google. Kantor Google terkenal dengan beragam fasilitas yang menyenangkan. Ini juga jadi salah satu alasan mengapa banyak sekali anak muda bermimpi bisa bekerja di sini. Tapi ada alasan di balik semua fasilitas gratis ini. Mungkin balance juga ya, all about balance, mana nak sini um, target kita, target setiap tim mau main agresif juga dan core worknya banyak, pasti banyak. Tapi kerja keras kak. Iya. Karena kalau di sini main, jadi kita jalan-jalan. Ada makan, minum. Ini jangan-jangan iya. nanti orang miranya kerja di Google seseru-seru senang-senang ini. Ini target juga kan? Dua-duanya lah, dua-duanya. dua-duanya iya. kan? Work hard, play hard. Oh, iya. <laughs> Bener. Dan memang the whole reason, tujuan utama Rachel dan Alif kerja di Google untuk membu- itu ya, memberi dampak. Itu apakah itu memang motivasi utamanya atau atau sesederhana kayaknya keren aja kerja di Google. Gitu. <laughs> <laughs> motivasi utama dan apakah memang merasa sudah dapat apa yang dicari dengan kerja di, di tech company sebesar Google? Uh, ya itu sebenarnya salah satunya sih. Kayak kita tuh, kalau aku sih pribadi emang pengen membuat sesuatu yang impact-nya tuh langsung kerasa ke semua orang lah. Kayak gitu. Dan kebetulan banget kan kayak apa aku yang buat tuh uh, bisa uh, ada dampaknya ke Google Search kan. Itu keren banget menurutku. Hmm. Um, tapi yang kedua tuh sebenarnya aku merasa kayak challenge technical challenge-nya itu jauh lebih susah di sini ketika uh, berhadapan sama jumlah data kan web tuh banyak banget kan berapa sih jumlah website di web itu mungkin jutaan lebih bahkan kan miliaran kayak gitu itu uh, teknik-tekniknya tuh jadi beda gitu jadi aku emang pengen belajar dari um, expert-expertnya yang udah bertahun-tahun mengerjakan hal itu jadi aku pengen mengasorb otak mereka gitu Hmm. Kayak gitu sih sebenarnya. Dan kesempatan itu memang hanya yeah. bisa didapatkan kalau kerja di lingkungan uh, kantor yang memang talent poolnya yeah, yeah. itu besar dan sevariatif itu. Jadi merasa terchallenge terus. Iya, yeah, kayak gitu benar. Dan kalau kemudian cita-cita anak-anak atau anak-anak muda sesimpel mau seperti Alif mau kerja di sini juga gitu, sesimpel itu 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 cita-cita yang valid kan? Cita-cita yang valid ya. Iya kan? And yeah, yeah, what would you say to them? Um, I mean adalah itu semua mungkin uh, karena aku dulu merasa sangat uh, discourage kayak aku aku nggak tahu kalau ini tuh bisa gitu aku bisa keluar kayak gitu oh kamu juga sempat dulu have ini kayak mer- ragu I, I, gitu I had a lot of doubt at in the beginning aku aku nggak nggak yakin lah bisa kayak gitu sama sekali kayak aku tapi um, I think like I talk to some of my friends uh, kayak dan alumni TB juga yang udah itu dan mereka bilang it's okay gitu uh, kayak the worst thing that can happen kayak paling parahnya aku ya udah kan nggak dapat gitu aku bisa coba lagi aku bisa kayak learning apa sih yang aku kurang aku pelajarin, 
Abis itu aku Jadi ada proses ini. saya gak langsung keterima yeah, yeah, juga yeah, ya Soalnya yeah. anak-anak sekarang semuanya insta Soalnya ngeliat di, di instagram tuh kayaknya langsung yeah, yeah. jadi gitu Gak, gak kelihatan tuh Berat, pas yeah, lagi Selanjoran-selanjoran kayak Andovi gini gak kelihatan <laughs> <laughs> Ini Andovi lagi selanjoran di sini <laughs> Behind the scene nya Gak tau gitu kan anak, yeah. ya Banyak anak muda sekarang apalagi dengan sosial media gitu ya Ngeliatnya ngelihat pas lagi serunya kita foto yeah. di sini nih yeah. nggak tahu kita keren di sini nih karena ada yang lagi selanjuran <laughs> di sini gitu tapi Bener. jadi you went through that process kan yeah, yeah. tahun pertama aku kerja di Google ya mbak Nana uh, di mejaku di meja ada pajangan ada print out semua email mungkin ada lebih dari 10 ditolak Google <laughs> <laughs> karena aku dulu pengen banget kerja di Google jadi kayak aku apply mungkin kayak 7 sampai delapan kali dan aku print out semua rejectionnya aku sengaja pajang. kamu taruh sengaja oh. karena itu kan yang kayak Alex bilang proses semuanya proses dan uh, kayaknya kalau mau belajar anything bisa um, kita bisa belajar resource-nya banyak zaman sekarang digital semua ada dan banyak banget sebenarnya program mentorship dari uh, tinggal kita google aja sih sebenarnya kayak mentorship tech Indonesian mau yang dari sisi women ada, mau yang dari sisi coding ada, mm-hmm. sisi segala macam, udah banyak banget yang ada sekarang. Okay, so, kalau tadi bicara skill, kalau bicara mindset, mindset yang harus kita punya, kalau we wanna foster this apa namanya environment dan juga foster lebih banyak lagi bisa lahir Indonesia digital talent. Mungkin mindset penasaran. I think mm-hmm. asking questions yeah. uh, atau penasaran tentang apapun walaupun maupun topik atau skill atau industri kesehatan, finance, anything yeah. itu bisa lead kita untuk menemukan challenge yang baru, menemukan solusi yang baru. Mm-hmm. Tapi it just all starts dari kita penasaran aja. Yeah. Harus kepo. Harus kepo, uh, yeah, benar. Harus kepo, ya. harus kepo. Itu skill itu. Untungnya uh, di Indonesia sangat pintar yang kepo. Iya, yeah, betul. betul. <laughs> <laughs> harus always stay curious ya. Yeah, stay curious. Penasaran, yeah. pengen tahu. Dan juga jangan cuma berhenti di penasarannya. Mm-hmm. Iya. Yeah. Cari tahu gitu ya. Iya. Yeah. Yeah. Pengen tahu dan cari tahu. Kalau aku nambahin lagi, sebenarnya mindset uh, terbuka sih. Jadi kalau misalkan um, ya hargain pendapat orang lain, kalau misalkan mm. punya pendapat, mungkin pendapat kamu benar, tapi mungkin juga ada sisi lain gitu. Mm. Jadi kalau misalkan... Um, kayak different different opinion kan sebenarnya bisa dikembangin jadi uh, ketika buat produk gitu kan semuanya bisa ke cover lah kayak gitu karena semua opinion itu bisa valid mm-hmm. kayak gitu sih mm-hmm. terus sama kalau mau dahulin tadi sebenarnya salah satu challenge buat tech Indonesia itu sebenarnya akses sih mm-hmm. kayak uh, sekarang kan semua produk tuh semua nggak semua sih sorry tapi kayak kebanyakan tuh fokusnya masih di ibu kota kota-kota besar Indonesia kan kepulauan um, kayak gimana caranya orang-orang Indonesia yang nggak tinggal di kota besar juga dapat uh, efek positifnya kayak gitu. So how do you see Indonesia's role? Um, I mean we are the fourth most populous country. I mean a hundred yes. million people daily now tune into YouTube. So um, how do you see? I mean how can we play like a more active role, not just as a consumer but also you know as a content creator, create more content, actively involved in this creative new ecosystem. Well, uh, Indonesia is a really important market, and one of the things that we've seen with Indonesia is that is that it's a, a early adopter mm-hmm. of a lot of features. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a very dynamic uh, culture and and um, embracing technology. And so, uh, I mean, I think that um, I think. You know, Indonesia for us is an important place to continue to invest, and we've seen these incredible stories about what happens when people create, see content, and they have that available. Mm-hmm. There was actually like a really amazing story I, I read about a son who helped his mom um, by creating a robot, and he learned how to create that robot on, on YouTube. YouTube. Yeah. yeah. Do you still remember the first video on YouTube that you watch? Yes, I do. Um, well, so I had an unusual experience, which is that I was part of creating online online video experience. Yes, yes. So Google actually, around the same time that YouTube was created, Google, um, actually even before YouTube was created, mm. we decided that we were going to have people post their videos and mm. just upload them to, mm. to Google. Um, well, the first video was actually of a bunch of puppets, and they were singing 
in a, some kind of Nordic language. It was a language okay. I didn't know. And I wasn't sure what to think about it because it was so unusual and I'd never seen anything like that before. But It wasn't it, on TV for sure. No, it definitely wasn't. It definitely was not traditional TV, media. Yeah, yeah. It was more user-generated type yeah, of content. Yeah. And then I also remember the first big hit that we had, mm -hmm. which was actually a Backstreet Boys video, which was... Like a, a real band or just someone singing Backstreet no, Boys? No, it was two students in China Okay. doing their homework. Actually, their, their roommate's doing their homework in the back, and the kids are singing. Oh, okay. And it was so funny. Um, and that was the first video that was a hit on, uh, on Google Video random. at the time. I, back then, it was that random video. It still is now. Isn't? It's still it's the same thing. It's still yeah. like someone who does something that's uh -huh. unknown, but it's uh -huh. really funny, and it catches everyone's attention. And that's what we saw. And so we realized that people who are not necessarily famous, can create a video that everyone else wants to see. Mm -hmm. um, and that regular people want have a lot to share, mm -hmm. and that people actually want to watch uh, regular people's videos. Mm -hmm. And so that insight, like, oh, you doesn't have to always be a star. Yeah. Um, stars can be made from yeah. people who are just doing their daily lives mm -hmm. and sharing something about them. And mm -hmm. so having that insight that, that you know, everyone can be a star, mm -hmm. everyone can share something about their life, and people do want to see that, and they mm -hmm. do want to be, they do want to connect to each and other that way. that's the DNA of YouTube, you think? That's the core values of YouTube, that everyone can, you know, can be a student and a teacher? Yeah, that definitely. I mean, so we talk about having a mission, which is to give everyone a voice and to show them the world. The idea that everyone has something to share, and that you can learn a lot, that you can mm. see the world. You could be at home, but you could learn anything. You mm. could experience a world. You could hear all kinds of voices and perspectives mm. from YouTube. And so that's part of our mission. Mm -hmm. Di masa depan, setiap orang bisa menjadi populer. Hanya dalam waktu 15 menit, kata seniman tersohor Andy Warhol. Tibalah kita di masa yang sudah melampauinya. Seseorang bisa muncul, entah dari mana, lalu hanya butuh 15 detik untuk dicintai. Silih berganti, setiap hari kita merayakan yang baru sembari melupakan yang lalu. Pun bagi yang tiba waktunya memudar, setidaknya cerita mereka pernah didengar. Dari dalam layar, mereka bisa sebebas itu berkisah sambil seakan menatap langsung penontonnya satu persatu. Bahkan kepada orang yang tidak pernah mereka sangka, begitu luas, hingga mereka tak lagi bisa menerka kemana cerita itu akan sampai dan menjadi begitu berharga. Hmm. Alright, so here we are, one of the uh, elephants. Um, cool thing about these guys is that, is that they have really, really, really long um, trunks, and that's, that's cool. And that's pretty much all there is to say. You know, but YouTube has actually, like, shaping the culture, shaping the world, has big responsibilities. Sure. Does that way it got to you sometimes, being, you know, to have that enormous power and responsibility? There, I mean, there are definitely times where it does weigh on me, and I, but I also really want to be thinking about how to go out to the experts and get mm. the best advice from the experts. So, mm. but it does weigh on me, and there are times that something happens where I see something and and you know I I, I want to do a good job. I want to be responsible. I want to help people, and so there are times where there's something that I see that could upset me, or I, I worry like how can we how can we help? Mm -hmm. And what do you usually do when those times come? Watch YouTube? Um, no. I usually <laughs> get on the phone. like a work for you now? No, I usually send an email okay. <laughs> to, to the people that work for me okay. about how we're going to fix the situation. Okay. So it's still working. I mean, like, you know, how do you relax yeah. and... Oh, how do I relax? Well, I, um, I mean, I relax. I, I, mean, I love to be outside. Mm -hmm. I love to be in I, nature mm -hmm. and see friends and family and mm -hmm. just have fun. Yeah, it's I, always good. I, mean, I try to have like, balance. I try to have balance. Otherwise, uh, you burn out. Of course, being a CEO of YouTube. Yes. <laughs>